Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Nancy Birdsall, the president of the Center for Global Development. We're, um, I'm extraordinarily pleased today to have the opportunity to introduce to you Christine Lagarde, well known to all of you, I'm sure, as the managing director of the IMF. Um, Madam Lagarde will be talking about sustainable development. This is a thrill for those of us at the Center for Global Development. Our mission is global prosperity that is shared and inclusive, and sustainable development is a central part of that, of course. I think it's also very important that we are going to hear today from someone who recognizes that there's not only a crisis in Europe, there's a crisis of a longer term nature, an environmental crisis, particularly for the world's poor and vulnerable, who are the ones who suffer most when those of us in the, ri in the rich world and the rich and powerful in general get the policies wrong or fail to do the policies appropriately. Uh, I think it's an incredibly important sign that uh, the managing director of the IMF has chosen <coughs> at this difficult moment in the, in the world in terms of a short term set of short term problems to focus all of us on this long term issue that matters so much for everyone. Uh, you will all know that before uh, Christine Lagarde was managing director, she was the Minister of Finance in France. Uh, you may not know or remember, I was surprised, that she has also been the Minister of uh, Ag Agriculture and Fisheries. Maybe it was the depletion of the fisheries that got her thinking about the issue of sustainable development. Prior to that, she was at Baker and McKenzie, and among other things there, she was chairman of its global executive committee, chairman of its global strategic committee. So this is a woman who's obviously smart and savvy, obviously knows how to manage things, uh, and obviously knows how to help us make uh, for a better world. Before I ask her to come up, I'd like to mention that we have at least two board members here. Um, John Lipsky, who is a former uh-oh, I'm going to get the title wrong. First Deputy M Managing Director at the IMF, and Patty Stonecipher, former President of the Gates Foundation, uh, and I think still Chair of the Board at the Smithsonian Institution. I apologize to other board members if you're here, you may be. Uh, thank you all very much in advance for coming to hear about sustainable development from the Managing Director of the IMF, uh, a big, important thing in itself. Madam Lagarde. Thank you very much, Nancy, and good morning to, uh, to all of you. It's a great pleasure being here, and I would like to thank the uh, Center for Global Development for sponsoring this event. Uh, Nancy, under your leadership, the center is doing terrific work, and I would like to, to acknowledge that. Uh, you've mentioned the fact that I was uh, a lawyer by background and uh, a chairman of a very large law firm, uh, which gives me two sp specific attributes. Number one, I was told that if I was capable of managing 600 partners, I could herd as many cats in the world as was required. And uh, number two, uh, it has given me the habit of putting my disclaimer in first, and then go into the rhetorics of what I want to talk about. And my disclaimer will be that I'm not trying to reinvent the IMF into being an environmental expert on Earth, and many of you are far more experts than I am and belong to organizations that have far more expertise than the IMF does. So my disclaimer being put in, uh, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to be here today. Not only because we are not going to talk at all about the Eurozone, not at all about Greece, not at all about Spain, and because we're going to concentrate on longer term issues, issues that will survive the current crisis, that will probably survive us as well, and which will matter for our children, grandchildren, and thereafter. It has been 20 years now uh, that since the world leaders first went to Rio de Janeiro uh, to commit to the noble goal of protecting the planet for future generation. And now, 20 years on, 
we will be journeying back, at least some of us will, I'm certainly of those that will be going to Rio Plus 20, to affirm our commitment to sustainable development, to the idea that we should strive for economic growth, environmental protection, and social progress at the same time, the three not being mutually exclusive. The idea that different economic, environmental, and social objectives can be seen as distinct aspects of a single vision, essential parts of a connected whole. But while those bound for Rio might have the best of intentions, they certainly ha don't have the best of circumstances. And as you said, Nancy, today I believe that we're facing a triple crisis, an economic crisis, an environmental crisis, and also increasingly a social crisis. The global economy is still rocked by turmoil with uncertain prospects for both growth and jobs, let alone stability. The planet is warming rapidly with unknown and possibly dear consequences down the line. And across too many societies, the gap between the haves and the have-nots is getting wider and strains are getting fiercer. And although distinct, these different threats feed off each other in an intricate interplay. And we cannot address each in isolation. We need to generate a vigorous response that will actually provide a virtuous circle and exit from the vicious circle. And it's one more reason, apart from conviction, why the IMF should also be interested in those matters. So let me uh, try to concentrate uh, my remarks to you this morning around three uh, aspects. First of all, uh, let us see how we can get the basics right. Second, see how we can get the pricing of the green economy right. And I think that in that particular category, the IMF can help. And uh, let's see how we can make growth right that is more inclusive in our view. Turning to the basics and, and getting those basics uh, right. Sustainable development must spring from macroeconomic and financial stability, which in turn paves the way for robust growth and a productive economy. And this is the first step of the journey. Of course, it is of overwhelming importance today. Over the past four years, we have been mirrored in the worst economic crisis since the Great Depression, and we're not out of it yet. In fact, tensions are on the rise. Financial stability risks have once more moved front and center, and great uncertainty hangs over global prospects. Too many regions today are still stuck in a trap of low growth and high unemployment. Right now, there are approximately 200 million people looking for a job, of which 70 million are young people who have not even yet started getting on the ladder of the job market. So we need a strategy that is good for stability, good for growth, where stability is conducive to growth and growth facilitates stability. And it must start at the moment with the advanced economies and clearly uh, at the epicenter of where the crisis lies, which is uh, the Eurozone. But it's not just a job for the Eurozone. It has many aspects, and it will require all to actually give a hand to actually try to get it right. But first, there must, there must be a rekindle uh, demand. Uh, to, we must rekindle demand today to get the growth engine up and running again. Now, it's not about putting in a big stimulus package, as was done um, four years ago. It's about a, a, a very subtle combination of more accommodating monetary policy, use of common resources to provide direct support to banks, and where it's fiscally available, growth-friendly policies, combining particularly support to investment. Now in this context, fiscal stability is incredibly important. And policymakers that are not under the pressure of the markets 
must give very clear indication of where in the medium to long term their policies are going to fall. And those policies must be well anchored to give the degree of confidence that is needed so that investors, markets if you will, will understand where it's heading and what is the goal for financial stability. If they don't do that, then clearly the adjustment that will have to be made at some stage will be bigger, will be harder. So that's the first part. What they need to do next is make sure that that little growth that is being recovered is not lost and is actually for the long term. And to do that, clearly reforms have to be made on the supply side to improve the productivity of economies. And in that vein, particularly in the epicenter of where the crisis is at the moment, there has to be product and labor markets reforms that will actually improve the productivity of those economies, particularly in the non-traded sectors and in regions lacking competitiveness. Labor reforms must be conducted with a way to get back to the job market the disenfranchised people who have been out of the market for too long or who simply cannot access the market at the moment. That's for the, the epicenter of where the crisis is. But it's not just, as I said, for the epicenter countries to actually do something. Everyone has to, has to give a hand. And the rest of the world should also invest in growth and stability. Most developing countries, if you look at their fundamentals at the moment, are doing reasonably well. And if you look at where potential for growth is more likely to pan out in growth, it will be in the developing world. Because <coughs> they have done what they had to do. They had buffers to protect against uh, the crisis, and they have used those buffers and will be actually under uh, strain to replenish those buffers uh, if and when the crisis was to uh, worsen. So they must stand ready to rebuild those policy buffers and, and be prepared to use them if the crisis worsens. Those which have fiscal space uh, clearly should prepare to use it if conditions continue to deteriorate. Now, developing countries must also uh, diversify the economy. They must properly integrate their trade, both regionally and on a global basis. And if we look, for instance, at sub-Saharan Africa, there is a need for infrastructure that amounts to about 15% of the region's GDP. It's a huge challenge, but it's one that is not insurmountable. And it would be key to actually provide the underground for sustained growth in those countries. What do we do at the IMF? Well, I will spare you the details of what we do for the epicenter of the crisis because it's all over the papers and talked about massively. But what do we do, for instance, for the low-income countries? What do we do for the developing world? Well, the IMF has helped and will continue to help those countries. Uh, when the crisis first broke, uh, and uh, clearly uh, John Lipsky will remember that because he was one of the key players, uh, the IMF responded to the needs of the low-income members with quadrupled lending, doubled access limits on loans, and zero interest rates. Those zero interest rates, highly concessional of course, have been extended and are extended to the end of this year. We also use our resources to help countries cope with the economic consequences of natural disasters. This has been the case particularly in Kenya, and also in Burkina Faso in the last few months. Now, is that enough? Obviously, in addition to that, we provide a lot of technical assistance on the ground uh, to respond to the specific needs of the, the countries in areas where we have uh, expertise. But is it enough in terms of resources? I'm afraid not, which is why I'm on yet another crusade to raise more funds and to make sure that our poverty and uh, a PRGT, Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust, is actually sufficiently replenished so that we can respond to the needs of uh, the low-income countries. So that's 
I'm afraid in a nutshell and probably too uh, broadly brushed, uh, what, what needs to be done to, to get it right and to put stability uh, back on the map, which it is not at the moment. And let me turn now to the, the, the second uh, point that I would like to make, which is you know, getting it right is fine, but we need to get growth back, but not back in the way it was. We need to get it on a different uh, track, but we need to get it going again. We are all aware that economic growth can potentially harm the environment and that environmental degradation can in turn hurt economic performance. So we need to get the, I'm, I'm almost tempted not to use the word because it seems so restrictive, uh, to get the green economy uh, right. But this is certainly a good portion of it. And what I'm most concerned about is that growth is coming back, but it's coming on a different track, one that actually incorporates those environmental concerns that bring us together. Climate change is clearly one of the great challenges of our time and one of the great tests of our generation. For the world's poorest and most vulnerable people, climate change is not just a distant possibility, it's a present reality. If we look at Africa, for instance, it's a continent that contributes least to climate change and yet suffers most of it. It is among the regions most at risk from natural disasters and it's the region with the highest rainfall volatility and the region that desperately needs the rain for agriculture, growth and employment and where you find the largest share of GDP actually generated out of agriculture and the highest number of employed people in that particular field. The writing is on the wall. We already see warning signs of desertification, recurrent drought, drought and flooding, low crop yields, diseased and population displacement. And it could get much worse. For example, the United Nations estimates that the hit to agriculture in Southern Africa could lead to nearly a million more undernourished children. Let's look at the threat of the global economy and people's life from rising water levels as well. Across the world, about $3 trillion of valuable assets lie at or before the sea level, precarious location in a warming world. Once again, it is the world's poorest and most vulnerable people who will end up paying the highest price. Now, environmental problems do not end up with climate change. And if we look at, for instance, a continent, rather a country, uh, like India, for instance, which relies heavily on the use of coal, uh, pollution from coal generation plants causes about 70,000 premature deaths a year. That's different from climate change, but equally something needs to be done about it. And what should we do? Let me start by noting that, again, the IMF is not an environmental organization. It's an international financial institution which primary objective to be found in its Article 1 is to help with the financial stability of the world. But we cannot ignore, we cannot ignore the extensive human suffering and the misallocation of resources that leads us down the wrong path. And that's where, via financial stability, we need to be concerned about those matters that I've just been talking about. And where we can, certainly with the expertise of the IMF, help is with getting the price rights right. The late Nobel Prize winner, Wangari Maathai, put it succinctly, the generation that destroys the environment is not the generation that pays the price. That is the problem, paying the price. I'll, I'll share with you a little anecdote. About 27, 26 years ago, when my first child was born, I was lucky to have a nanny looking after the house and the baby when I was back to work. And that nanny was from Poland. 25 years ago, you follow me, the Iron Curtain was certainly still there. And one day I came home a bit earlier, walked into the house, and most taps were on. The water was flooding. 
not flooding the house, but there was just water running. And I said uh, to the nanny, I said, you know, you have, to, you have to turn them off. You have to stop the water running. It's costly. And she looked at me and she said, oh, but back at home it didn't cost anything. That was in Poland, pre-Iron Curtain. It didn't cost anything. So because it didn't cost anything, because it didn't have a price, you could waste it. You could use it or waste it, whichever, but it didn't make any difference. So that's just, it's not just to tell you the story of my Spanish nanny, but it's just to point out the fact that if there is no price, there is no cost, so we can waste. So getting the price right is critical, and as I said, I think the IMF can help in that respect. Because it means setting fiscal policies to make sure that the harm we do is also reflected in the price we pay. And I'm thinking clearly about environmental taxes, emission trading systems, under which government issue and preferably sell. Issuing has had its time, but actually sell pollution rights. It's basically a variation of the old mantra, you break it, you buy it. Les pollueurs sont les payeurs. I can see that there's one person at least who understands me. <laughs> Those who pollute shall be the payers, in a way. Now, you can read a lot more about this because, you know, it's all very well me saying it to you now, but it's far more important that there be publication by the IMF on that particular topic. And uh, you can read about this in a new IMF e-book, you will not find it in hard copy, it's an electronic book uh, on carbon pricing which we are launching actually today. So today an electronic book is being published by the IMF on this particular topic. And it's intended as a practical guide for policymakers. So it's not a lot of uh, theoretical, uh, rhetorical demonstration, it's, it's a practical guide, guidelines. And you can find it on the IMF's webpage by following the link to Rio plus 20. Now this kind of environmentally sensitive fiscal policy has two distinct, distinct advantages. First of all, it is the best and most comprehensive route for reducing environmental damages. That's back to my story of the Polish nanny. When you know the price, when you know the cost, then certainly you can, you can decide what route you're going to take and what alternative options you can explore and do research and development on. So it can galvanize clean technology development and deployment by the private sector, such as investment in ener energy efficiency and renewables. And it's confirmed by experience in many countries. A push towards greener investment can be a great boon for developing countries. There is a lot of scope for filling infrastructures gaps in places like Africa with clean technology. And this leads to higher growth and greener growth. That's advantage number one. And it will talk to those that are environmentally minded and concerned. It will talk to those who are interested in research and development and who want to apply their brain, their skills, and often somebody else's money on developing new technologies. There's another advantage which plays well with finance ministers. And when I was finance minister for France, I made a point of participating in those joint sessions between environmental ministers and finance ministers because they intersect around money. Because most finance ministers, most governments for that matter, need revenue. They need revenue either to reduce their deficit or when they don't have deficits, they need revenue to spend it appropriately to uh, finance their strategy goals. And obviously, revenues is generated by the tax instruments, by the licenses fees that I was talking about. Now, a few numbers here, and I don't want to get that wrong, so I'm going to put my glasses. That's the price you pay for age. In the United States, for instance, a carbon tax of about $25 per ton of CO2, which would add 22 cents to a gallon of gasoline. Gasoline. Okay, here you start thinking just very impractical. 
could bring in about 1% of GDP or over $1 trillion in a decade. Charges on international aviation and maritime, maritime emissions would raise about a quarter of the $100 billion needed for climate adaptation and mitigation in developing countries, resources that developed countries have committed to mobilize by 2020. Those are not small numbers, those are big numbers. At present, where are we? We are at base camp in terms of getting the price right. Right now, less than 10% of worldwide greenhouse gas emissions are covered by formal pricing programs. Only a handful of cities charge for the use of gridlocked roads, and farmers in rich countries are undercharged, if charged at all, for the increasing scarce water resources that they use. Many countries continue to subsidize polluting energy systems, and these subsidies are costly for the budget and costly for the planet. Countries should reduce them. That's another area where the IMF can actually help out, because we are in a privileged position to actually see the effects on fiscal positions, the effect on budgets of those subsidy schemes that are being used uh, across the world in many countries. And we are in a good position to actually indicate how they can best be removed, whether it's very gradual, less so gradual, but in any event preceded by preparatory work so that people actually understand what is going to be in lieu of, instead of subsidies, and how it's going to be targeted so that the low-income people, the less privileged people, actually keep the benefit or the equivalent of the benefit of subsidies, whereas those that can readily afford not having the subsidies actually bear the burden. There is much work to be done at the technical level in terms of the appropriate design of taxes and tax-like instruments to get the prices right. The IMF will play an active role in this. We have an upcoming side event in Rio, plus another event with the UN Environment Programme later this year. And at both events, we will be talking about the use of fiscal policy and reform of energy subsidies to promote green growth. I've asked my staff in collaboration with others to put principle into practice by coming up with actionable guidance for both developed and developing countries on precisely how to get these prices right, or at least better. And I expect interim results by the end of this year with a final report within 12 months. And that will tackle both the price setting principles with very practical guidelines associated to it and the subsidy removal programs as well. On that front, we are working together with the UN and the World Bank uh, on the issue of natural resource uh, accounting to make sure that we can properly measure the incomes and costs associated with natural resources and how extraction affects national wealth. That's a bit of a third project. So you have the price setting, you have the subsidy removal, and you have the pricing and measurement of natural resources and use of it. Okay, my third and last point uh, after the, uh, you know, getting the basics right, getting the, the green economy going through the use of prices, uh, I would like to touch on how necessary it is that growth actually be inclusive. What does it mean? It means that all must be able to share in the fruits of prosperity and that all be given the opportunity to fulfill their potential. Easier said than not, yes. But without this, the social threads that bind society together can rip apart with devastating economic consequences, devastating financial stability consequences. And indeed, recent research shows that countries with more equitable distributions of income are associated with greater macroeconomic stability and more sustainable growth over the longer term. We have actually, at the fund, done research in that respect, and we, we do have empirical uh, work that demonstrates that principle. The more inclusive, the more sustainably solid uh, the growth is, is to be. It's preliminary work. It needs to be complemented by other people's research. We will continue to do some research on that front, but it seems to be quite clear. 
Clear as well is the fact that jobs must be at the forefront of any strategy for inclusive growth. Decent and steady employment is the sure foundation for human dignity, the best avenue to rewarding and fulfilling lives. So we are working on ways to spur both growth and jobs, and to make sure that the growth we get produces the job that we need. This affects all dimensions of policies, labor market, fiscal policies, monetary, financial, trade, and macroprudential. Now, the IMF, as I said, is not an environmental institution, nor are we a labor institution. And we should not try to reinvent ourselves and become one. Uh, so, as a result, we try to collaborate with those that are labor institutions. And we do quite a lot of work with the International Labor Organization, the ILO. And we do quite a lot of work as well with the International Trade Union Confederation, the ITUC, in order to push those objectives. Not always easy, but we're determined to continue having the dialogue because I'm personally convinced that, that one feeds into the other. We are also looking at other ways to help promote more inclusive growth, including better access to trade and finance, including microfinance, better transparency and governance, and better social protection. For example, we are looking at the role played by governance and the business environment in making growth more inclusive among the Arab transition countries. It's, it's an ideal set of partners to work with because they are determined actually to pursue those objectives and they're prepared to implement changes as they do so. On the fiscal side, we have new research showing that government spending and taxes play a vital role in reducing inequality, especially in advanced economies. Again, on this front, I'm not just saying it out of the blues, we have research uh, done on that in that respect. And at a time of tight mm, budgets, it is imperative to keep distributional implication in mind. Options here include reducing tax evasion and tax avoidance, making income tax more progressive at high income levels, and protecting the kinds of tr <laughs> social transfers that promote a more even income distribution. I'll give you an example. I was in, I'm not going to talk about Greece. I'm going to talk about Latvia. Uh, I was in Latvia a few days ago, and uh, although there had, it is a success story of a, a, a clear sort of internal, determined, um, state-owned uh, devaluation, but equally our recommendation to that country was make sure that you keep the social safety nets in place, because with unemployment at the rate of 16%, you need to make sure that the less privileged in the society have the support of the state to actually keep going and re-enter the job market as growth picks up, which, which it does at the highest percentage growth in the entire European Union. Just as advanced economies have done it, uh, developing countries also need to allocate public spending on social safety nets, that's the point. To make these reforms possible, countries need to mobilize more revenues. And in a way, it's a loop the loop as the Dutch would say. More revenue needed. Remember what we were talking about? These taxes, the license fees, the pollution rights, generating revenue. Well, revenues are needed, certainly with the purpose to include, redistribute properly, to make sure that it contributes to more sustainable growth and certainly better financial stability. Those are numbers that result from research done by our financial department. Uh, they think that an extra 2 to 4% of GDP is plausible based around reforms like streamlining tax codes and procedures, getting rid of exemptions, and strengthening revenue and customs administration. Think about it. Even if it was at the low end, I'm assuming that they're right, of course. But at the low end, an extra 2% point of GDP when we have a an average forecast of 3.5, we're talking about big numbers. <coughs> These countries also need to target spending to the people who need it most by moving away from those subsidies regimes that we see mostly around the world at the moment that distribute evenly without distinguishing between the less privileged and the privileged ones, especially on energy, and moving towards effective and targeted social programs such as the conditional cash transfers. I'll mention that we often have in mind um, 
Indonesia, for instance, which has slightly modified and qualified its, its uh, subsidy removal system. We think of Nigeria that targeted 400 and had to sort of cut back to 50, but at least has done the 50% removal. But there is one really good story, uh, and that's the story of Iran when it comes to removing uh, subsidies. Because they did so in, in actually making available and storing in the bank accounts of people the amount that they would receive if and when the energy subsidies were removed. So people knew exactly what they were going to look for and what they were going to have in lieu of, of the subsidies. And gradually, then the subsidies were removed. And the level of anxiety that is often associated with a program that aims at removing subsidies was actually tempered by the fact that people knew that they were getting something in lieu of and they could actually put their hand on it. Now, final point, because you know, I've, I've tried to identify where the IMF can help in relation to those, those main objectives. Uh, we also actually take into account these issues of inclusive growth in the way in which we design our programs. It's not an easy thing to do, but we try to have that embedded in the program. For instance, spending on health and education rises faster in countries with IMF-supported programs than in developing countries as a whole. Over an average five-year program period, health spending rises by one percentage point of GDP and education spending by three-quarter of a percentage point. Now, obviously, it is the countries themselves that deserve credit for this. Our job is simply to help them along the line. We are also collaborating closely with the International Labour Organization, with the World Bank, with other UN agencies on the Social Protection Floor Initiative, which helps poor countries set up basic levels of protection at an affordable cost. And this is also a very important step in the right direction. At the end of the day, social protection should not be seen as a cost, but also as an investment, an investment in sustainable development. So let me conclude by reaffirming uh, that, one, the IMF is not an environmental institution. Two, the IMF is not a labor organization. But because these two principles, objectives, goals, in a way are overwhelming the sort of short-term financial stability goals, which itself is necessary to feed the purpose of defending environmental goals and making sure that growth is inclusive. It makes the role of the IMF particularly relevant in the debate that we must have and that we must make sure does not fall way behind, not on the screen of top priorities at the moment, simply because they are urgent crisis in the epicenter of where the crisis is. However difficult, however long, however costly, those crises will find their way into solutions. But the long-term challenges that we have, we should not lose sight of them, because they will not go away. They have to be on our mind, and they have to be on the list of priorities of leaders. And it's certainly one of the messages that I will deliver when I'm uh, in Rio in about 10 days' time. Thank you very much. Something very important about your saying it and about your committing yourself in this speech to follow up inside. Now, I do want to share one story for you that it's like the oh, nanny the story. Nanny as well. the, no. That's not the Polish nanny, but it's, it's, it's related because it captures both inclusiveness and the waste issue. I remember being in Lima, you know, 25 years ago, and I went to have dinner with a friend of a friend in a very lovely family, probably in the top 2% of all uh, households in terms of income. And they had a lovely swimming pool, and th they were complaining. They had been trying to get a bill for the water <coughs> in their swimming pool for more than 10 years. So there was no metering, there was no billing, and they were obviously you know, enlightened and unhappy to see that people living in the slums at the top of the hill were paying uh, a price infinitely greater for their water. So it was about waste, 
although presumably they didn't overdo on the swimming pool, um, and, and about inclusive growth as well. So thank you I very much. I was paying my bill. <laughs> yes, you were paying the bill, so you knew, right? Not the Polish nanny. So I would like to say, for those of you who may not know, um, I looked at the book that's coming out, and it is about carbon taxes and or cap and trade. So it's very focused on climate. And that brings me to the issue of politics, as well as sort of bureaucracies. I thought I'd try to have you uh, think about that out loud for a moment. We have difficult politics in the US on climate, and as uh, some of your discussion of pricing suggested, it's tough to get prices right around the world, in, in, all, in developing countries as well. Um, could you say a word about, I mean, if this is one of the reasons why the IMF is so important. It has a certain um, level of independence and tremendous credibility. But maybe you could say, you know, a word about how you see, in particular, say, the US on the climate issue. What role can the IMF play in helping those of us concerned with policies, particularly on climate in this country, uh, make progress, even small progress? I, th I think you, uh, you, you need to use uh, both cards, depending on, on, the, on the audience. Um, the card number one is you know, getting the pricing right, putting in place the, um, the tax incentives, all the cap and trade um, schemes in place is going to actually improve uh, and, and, and reduce, improve the situation, reduce the risk arising from climate change. Uh, and, and will actually push the research and development in alternative schemes, in alternative sources of energy uh, that will be respectful of the environment. Uh, and and in, you know you sort of capture the audience of those that are supportive and those that are very keen to see uh, their country or their uh, company uh, be you know one of the leaders in the field of research and development because that's where uh, there is a future not only for humanity but there is also a future for their company or their country in terms of, of ranking in terms of, of success. But I think that we should not underestimate the second card that you can play, which is the, the revenue raising. Mm -hmm. The fact that in an environment where um, revenue is, is, is scarce and limited, and uh, the appetite for governments to go about you know, raising revenue is, is also not exactly um, high for all sorts of reasons, that particular segment of revenue raising is probably less unpopular than, than many other uh, revenue raising initiatives. And, and it can deliver quite a bit. I think the third card that, well, you know, that we, can, uh, we can help play uh, is, is that of countries that have done it and that have been successful in doing so. It's not without um, risks. You know, I, I myself was Minister of Finance when, uh, when uh, we launched the, uh, the, the pricing of of CO2, and, and we've had our success, but we also had you know, major risks because, because it's, it's a new market, and, and you want to turn it into a market, and it's highly intangible, uh, difficult to track, and prone to uh, many, uh, many frauds. So to learn from the experience of countries like Australia, like France, like you know, a few others, can also be of help, and we can certainly procure access to those, those sort of uh, lessons drawn from real life expertise. I hope you'll put the 22 cents, how much revenue that would yield in this country, or gasoline tax, into the next, uh, what's it called, the country reviews the, the, uh, that the IMF does. <laughs> Article four. 4, Article 4 reviews. Um, one more question, and I'm going to stay with climate, although it's very good and very important that you're your remarks embraced many other subjects. Um, and this has to do with the financing issue uh, for mitigation work and for adaptation in developing countries, which we've been very concerned about at the center. Um, and this has to do also with the role of the IMF as a global institution. <coughs> Can you say anything now about 
the possibilities. Um, in this ebook, there is discussion of maritime and aviation taxes as contributing to some global pool to work on these issues. Uh, is that something that maybe even in your um, you, you might be pursued at the staff level? At, there has been discussion already in the IMF, a very nice study, I thought, on the possibility of using somehow the capital in the IMF to build on and generate, uh, be able to borrow against it, this kind, this kind of sensible financial approach. Is that something that you would continue to support? Despite what probably is uneasiness, as you've suggested, on the part of the members, maybe on the part of the board, on the grounds that this is about stability in the long run. The answer is yes, to the extent that we can demonstrate that it's, 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 a, it's a conducive factor to financial stability, because those, you know, this is the objective of the, of the financial institution. And not only would there be, you know, um, suspicion as to whether or not we are stretching a little bit too, too far Mission our cream. mandate. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, it also has to do with the fact that there are other international financial institutions, particularly within the UN orbit, that are focusing on those issues and that are very keen to actually do their job and do it you know, according to the uh, UN CCCCCCC. FCCCC. <laughs> <laughs> So we are, you see, we, we, we're trying to do as best a job as we can using the resources we have, propagating as much as we can, but we are in between these two, you know, we are in those rail guards. Very good, okay, I think we don't have too much time, so uh, with your permission, I'll turn to those of you who'd like to ask questions, make comments. Um, let me ask you, particularly those in the press, to try to restrain yourself um, on issues of the day and uh, keep with the, the topic we have. Uh, oh, the issues of tomorrow. The issue, <laughs> yeah. Because in the long term, we're not all dead. That's right, that's right. I think you all know what I'm getting at. Um, sorry, okay. oh, Lisa, very good. Uh, I think you should wait for a mic, yes, please. Thanks so much, Lisa Friedman from Climate Wire. Thanks for doing this today. Um, can you tell us if beyond the ebook, if, if the IMF is going to make any specific commitments or pledges or proposals at Rio? Thanks. Pledges? I mean, we, this is, and I, I wish we were in that business, but we're not. Um, because, you know, we, we can study, we can publish, we can propagate, we can make available best practices. We can include those components in the design of the programs that we put in place. Uh, we can include those uh, perspectives and objectives in the technical assistance that we deliver uh, to, to, to our members. Uh, but you know, we, 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 we don't pledge, pledge uh, in, in that sense. We don't have the, uh, the authority, nor the ability, nor the room uh, for pledging. The, the World Bank can, can do that. Uh, there is a fund uh, that is there that effect, but our resources are really exclusively intended for uh, the financing of members that are facing difficulties, particularly balance of payment difficulties. So I, it's not as if I had a, you know, a big box full of cash and I could use it uh, smartly. It's, it's not what the MS is about. I do have the sense you're making a different kind of pledge. I see Vito Tansi there who headed the fiscal department, I remember for many years, that you're pledging a commitment some combination of continuing work and technical assistance yeah. and advice and dialogue on the issues of pr carbon pricing, other pricing, oh, no, natural resource yeah. accounting, et cetera, where uh, the IMF can do be a tremendous help. No, that, that could do, I was, I was really more focused on you know, money budget budgeting. in terms of right. you know, what's, what, yeah, what's, the, what's the budget. Right, I saw somebody here, yes. Please introduce yourself. Good morning, Ms. Madam Lagarde, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Seguero's International Group. I'm initially from Kenya. Uh, Madam Lagarde, looking at the global economy all over the world and uh, Africa being with great resources uh, in Africa, looking, <clears throat> how can you rate the African 
looking at the economy and what is in Africa and how would you say about Africa and its development uh, now and in future looking at the global economy. So that's what I wanted to know. And what, can, what is the most important thing that Africans can do to become actual country? Because Africa is poor for the poorest, low income country while it has resources. What can you tell African leaders, world and the, the world looking at the global economy? Thank you. I'll tell you something. The first thing that I would say is make sure that you uh, make the space and open the avenues for African women to take power. That's my third <laughs> There's an exciting new head of state in Malawi. I saw her yesterday, and yes. I will tell you that reinforces my faith in, uh, in, in African women. Uh, but uh, African men are fine as well. <laughs> You know, two things I would say. Uh, you are absolutely right that if we look at the uh, per capita GDP on average throughout the continent of Africa, we are in the um, less privileged, most exposed, most vulnerable uh, part of the world. Equally, it's also the part of the world where you see the most encouraging growth rates and where you see a whole fringe of countries north of the Sahara, granted, that are prepared to really experiment and do it with, not, not a, a clean sheet, but prepared to actually make changes. And uh, it, it's, it's an extraordinary laboratory of both innovation, dialogue, and where the state of play is, is fragile, moving, and there are threats, but there are also incredible opportunities on the horizon. And here the IMF is, is trying its best to be as close as possible, to make resources available both in terms of technical assistance, in terms of liquidity support if needed, and so on and so forth. So, as I said, space avenues for African women, and I think it has multiple dimensions. I'm not just saying it because, because I support from this course. I think it, it's multidimensional. Um, and uh, from a macroeconomic policy point of view, the situation in most of those countries, not all, but in most of those countries, is in a way uh, more safer and a bit more stable than, than in many advanced economies because they have taken the hit. They have had to reconstruct, to rebuild, to restructure, and, uh, and to actually institute those buffers that they have used hardly in the last couple of years. So from a macroeconomic point of view, many of them are not in, in such a bad situation at the moment. Many of them have, not all granted, many of them have natural resources that were undetected, unnoticed, and, and discovered only a few years ago, uh, which they are going to have to manage very carefully. And again, the IMF can help in that because the, the resource-rich trap in which uh, some countries uh, risk falling is something that we would want to help them avoid uh, going forward. Thank you, Madam Managing Director Will Davis with UNDP. Thank you for your rather, frankly, courageous remarks this morning. How do you address the skepticism from the developing countries that is reportedly gridlocking the discussions about green growth or green economy? in advance of Rio the charges that the green economy is just uh, more hypocritical advice, do as we say, not as we have done for 200 years, or that green economy could be a good excuse for protectionism. Isn't that the point of the speech? <laughs> <laughs> but still, it's a good question. Do you uh, want to add anything? <laughs> first of all, I, I cannot help thinking of, of Winston Churchill's very famous quote, which is, better to draw draw than to war war. That's point number one. So keep the dialogue going, stay at the table, and, and keep at it no matter what. Second, I think because we are right in the middle of it and because you spend your life with it, you feel that not much progress is being made. And we keep setting ourselves uh, targets, deadlines, amounts that need to be drawn, collected, or identified. But I think somebody coming from another planet would actually consider that we have made significant only in terms of awareness, uh, ideas, 
views, and even policies in many corners of the world. So we just need to keep at it. And uh, you and everybody else need to uh, continue insisting on, on those long-term objectives that require short and medium-term policies. And you know, I think it will be for a long time a bit like a mirage. You feel that you're there, and it keeps moving away from you. But each and every step that we produce to get there actually moves us in the right direction. I was thinking on the question about Africa that the jaw jaw of the IMF uh, in the 90s and the early 2000s on macroeconomic issues was a, a key part. You know, the dialogue, the interaction, the advice in in the resilience of those countries and other developing countries to the crisis. Vito, please. This will be an expert question. Yes, exactly. <laughs> You know, I was, uh, for 20 years, I was the director of the fiscal affairs at, uh, at the IMF. <clears throat> and listening to you, I the impression that uh, you were coming from a different planet, from a planet I very much welcome, you know. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I want to mention that uh, when we first, in my department of the fiscal affairs, we produced the first paper on the environment, you know, the relation, possible relation and uh, macroeconomic development. I had to go and lobby various executive directors to allow the paper to be discussed by the board. So they simply didn't have, you know, they thought it was crazy that the fund would have anything to say on this issue. Another time, I remember we did a paper on the taxation of, uh, of petroleum, you know, and uh, an executive director from a very powerful country managed to block the paper. So this was the institution I knew I left in 2000, and I'm extremely happy to be in your presentation of this. The world has changed, and I have maybe three days more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you. Lawrence? By the way, we'd, we'd be very happy to have you come back and get a sense of the changes, because I'd be very interested to have your, your insight. Center for Global Development. Thanks for your remarks. This is really terrific to see your leadership on this issue. Uh, we hosted a public event with Ban Ki-moon not long ago in which he was quite forthright in urging heads of state, and in particular President Obama, to attend Rio Plus 20. I think the likelihood that President Obama is going to attend is not large, but I wondered if you wanted to offer any thoughts on the uh, importance of attendance of the heads of government and heads of state at this event. Probably. <laughs> 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 I'll be looking forward to meeting Anthony and then I'll be David. Thank you very much for your comments. Really important and brief. Introduce yourself. I'm, I'm David Rudman with the Center for Global Development. Years ago, I actually wrote about the carbon taxes and such. So it's great with music to my ears. Um, I hope this isn't too much in the weeds. I, one comment, I had a chance to look at the book last night. Um, the, uh, the book, I think, cautions against squandering revenues from uh, carbon taxes or from uh, permit sales uh, on, on uh, programs that I think would not uh, stimulate the economy. In other words, if, if you cut taxes on labor and capital, this is good for the economy and can offset the effects of the carbon taxes. Um, but meanwhile, uh, uh, I have a colleague, Todd Moss, I don't know if he's here, uh, who's leading up an initiative on oil to cash, which is seeking to get African countries that have just discovered, and other countries that have just discovered the oil resources that you mentioned, to uh, disperse the revenues, the rents, to the population on a per capita basis, like it's done in Alaska. And there's a political theory there that this will improve the accountability of government. If governments want that revenue, then they will then need to tax it back. So I believe that in the analysis of the report, this kind of use of the revenue would be seen as squandering. Uh, and it's, it's not that the report is black and white about it. 
But it strikes me that there's a tension in, in how to use the revenues between what might support political development and what might support economic development. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that there is a one-size-fits-all response to, to, to that issue. And uh, you know, I remember having had a long discussion with uh, Minister Ngozi, who was previously Vice President of the World Bank, who is now Minister of you know, Development, Economy, and has a, a leading role of the team that, that deals with economic issues and energy as well. And uh, a good mix between what is actually redistributed and that gives credit to the political uh, stability of the of, of, of government and what is actually stored separately from that in, in a generation funds that, that will actually uh, guarantee the country for the future is, is you know from my very humble point of view and not check with the, your successor Mr. Talbot and Morelli uh, on the financial you know, from the financial department that would seem like a, a, a balanced way of doing it. Uh, of course, one of the references to squandering revenue also has to do with these co-options where there's giveaways up front, yeah. not for the people, but for those who otherwise might create uh, political resistance. Okay, I have a question back there and a question here. I can't see everyone. Let me... And so what I'd like to do, if, you, if it's okay with you, is collect several, and then you choose what you want to... Uh, we'll do that in a couple of rounds, if possible. So let's start here. Um, uh, thank you. It, I'm Suzanne Goldberg from The Guardian. Uh, focusing again on, on Rio, uh, what, you know, in all the talk that we've seen about, you know, unwieldy agenda, its difficulty in negotiations, lack of progress, as admitted by uh, the Secretary General, what for you would be the minimum outcome for you to consider uh, as a success, what, what would you like to see emerge from the Okay, you think about that, and then back here, and very back, standing up, <laughs> the way to get attention for your question. My name is Ivo Pulcic, I'm from Al Jazeera Balkans. My question is about Southeastern Europe or Western Balkans region. Uh, people over there, I mean politicians, they're shaking, they're very afraid of the uh, Eurozone, you know, situation over there and uh, they don't think even about uh, climate changes or fight against, against pollution. How do you see prospect of those countries from Croatia to, to Macedonia and that whole region uh, before the, the Rio and uh, actually how do you see the impact of Eurozone on those countries? Thank you. Um, <laughs> girls first. Uh, Leslie uh, Rawton from Reuters. I was wondering, um, one of the discussions in Rio is going to be um, to find a new greener measure of GDP, which includes, um, which accounts for exploitation of resources such as oil or fisheries, and um, you know, in a country's national GDP. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on how that should move forward. It seems like that would be in the IMF's realm. Okay, maybe, maybe. Okay. Uh, Ian Talley, Dow Jones. Oh, wait, let me wait for the next round. I think you might, might be better off. <laughs> it's already a lot of good questions. I'm not sure there'll be good answers. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, it's, I, I don't want to fall in the trap of this would be success, this would be failure. And from the IMF perspective, uh, what we, we hope is that our expertise can be drawn from, drawn upon, drawn upon, however you want to put it, uh, so that we can advance the overall objectives of the Rio Plus 20. So I'm not fixated on an amount, on a structure, on uh, something that would make headlines. I'm just here as managing director of the IMF saying we have expertise, whether it's in the field of pricing, whether it's in the field of subsidy, special income removals, whether it's in the field of uh, uh, fiscal policies, compact, including in the background both uh, in the inclusiveness of growth and the environmental concerns. 
because we want to help. That's why. Well, the, um, fear of the, the Eurozone, climate change, isn't climate change an issue? You know, but I'm, I'm seeing, I think, the president of Kosovo for another woman. Uh, and I will, I will try to understand from her where their concerns are. My sense is that in that particular part, in Macedonia, Kosovo, and others, there is a big need for infrastructure projects, particularly at rail transportation. That would probably go a long way to helping those countries develop. And that's one particular, it's not a pet project of mine, but it's, I think, in the field of infrastructure, it's one part of the world that could benefit from, from, from that. Um, and, you know, the more general question that you had about arbitrage between Eurozone fears and climate change, they are not in the same category. Uh, they're not in the same time zone, I was going to say, and they should not be mutually exclusive. The, um, okay, greener measure uh, for GDP, that, that's, that to me is a really important one. Uh, because the way in which we measure is going to determine the way in which we, we, we think, the way in which we determine our fiscal policies to prescribe fiscal policies. And you know, I was Minister of Finance when President Sarkozy launched the um, uh, Stiglitz Sen P2C Commission that worked on new way of measuring that fed the OECD work on you know, different ways of measuring uh, growth. So I, those are important initiatives. They're not going to be mainstream measurements but they should have a life, and they should be kept alive uh, long after the Commission has finished its work, because there's lots of things that we do not capture, and that should be captured, whether it's you know, in the field of cost of resources, cost of poor management of resources, value of cultural goods, value of public goods, and uh, so on and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm very concerned that we keep that on the agenda, and our Department of Statistics actually works with uh, the OECD and a few other players who are keen to develop new measurements. I think that could turn out to be, in this century, an absolutely fundamental contribution. The IMF is, it's absolutely necessary to have the IMF on, on that conversation, if not leading it. It may even be sufficient, frankly, in the medium term to have to have that lodged in the IMF. I mean, that would that would mean a huge change in mindset uh, about development, about inclusiveness, about environment, about so many things we care about. Okay, I think we have time for one more round. I, I cut you off, and then I have my colleague Kim and Amanda. Thank you, Ian Tyler Dow Jones. In your prepared remarks, Madam Lagarde, you mentioned a $25 per ton uh, carbon equivalent uh, tax or tax equivalent. Uh, doesn't that mean that there is a parts per million um, uh, concentration at the IMF? Parts per million concentration of carbon equivalent in the atmosphere? Uh, if you're going to say that at a certain price, then that means you're setting a certain target uh, uh, for a reduction of carbon equivalent uh, gases. Uh, and are you suggesting that there should be a carbon dioxide cost uh, and uh, right now that that would be beneficial to the global uh, economy and you said that there should be direct injection of uh, EU capital into banks um, I'm, not I'm not sure why direct injection in the fine uh, is, is necessary well that was a lot of questions <laughs> <laughs> and I, I actually looked at you probably haven't had time to look at the, the e-book that's coming out. I was going to say, I'm only the managing director. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll help you if you want on some of that. <laughs> but not only that, there was a speech on recapitalizing banks at the right moment, so you can take that one. Yeah. <laughs> I think it, your focus today on sustainable development, which is fundamental, but there's also a lot of talk these days about resilience. And it's particularly in the food security area where both in the medium term we have tighter supply demand balances and the long run of climate change. So more volatility likely, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And this seems like 
I know that the fund has facilities to try and help countries deal with volatility. They haven't been much drawn on, and there are some concerns about how well they work. I just wonder if you have any thoughts on how those could be more, made more effective given these problems with resilience and volatility. And there was a young woman back there. Thank you for your remarks, and thank you for going to Rio. My name is Catherine Manchester. I was a graduate student last week, and now I'm not sure what I am. Um, <laughs> job, job. <laughs> uh, and, and my question has to do with um, engaging audiences that you said would have an appetite for, for uh, climate tax policy. It's clear that's not, that's not the federal government in the United States, uh, but there are a number of American cities who have made progress on green economy policies. What is the role of the IMF for advising at the uh, subnational level? You know, it's, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question to which I don't have the answer, frankly. Because we, uh, and that may have to do with the structure of the fund, where the membership is 188 uh, nations, but we don't have membership of, of sub-national levels, if you will. And uh, we, we can only uh, get going, if you want, whether it's in technical assistance or whether it's in lending programs, um, at the request of the governance of the nation. Having said that, we publish enormously, and, uh, and our publications are, are, are available to all uh, sub-national uh, authorities included. But uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a fact you're right that a lot of cities have taken very critical measures to, uh, to, to promote different policies. And uh, having spent a few years in Chicago, I, I'm, I was a prime witness to the efforts undertaken by Mayor Daly at the time. And, uh, but, but frankly, no, I, I, I'll have to. Good question. Thank you. If you, you know, it sets me uh, thinking about how we how we can help if if we can uh, be of help. Actually, the the multilateral banks, of course, do. Uh, they can now lend where they have yeah. private sector windows or non sovereign yeah. guaranteed windows. So, yeah, maybe this is, your, this is not our situation. Your guys could get together with those guys. <laughs> okay. On the um, the issue of of volatility and volatility of commodities general and food in particular. Uh, you're right, we, we do have expertise, we do have instruments, and, uh, and we do help in particular the G20 in its uh, in one, one of its agenda items, uh, including now is the issue of the volatility of commodities. So we, we use that, we offer those instruments and this sagacity that we've accumulated over time uh, to the uh, particularly to the low-income countries, uh, which are the prime victim of, of volatility. Uh, we, we work cooperatively as well with various uh, food programs and, and agencies that are dedicated to that. But there is one, um, would, it's not a caveat, but it's, it's in a way, it's often an obstacle to what can be done. It's the issue of available information about, about stock, about inventories, about you know, what, what's, where, 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 where can we draw from? And that applies both to oil, to gas, but also to, uh, to food. To, uh, to farmed products. Uh, the G20 and the French presidency made some progress, and the Minister of Agriculture at the G20 level uh, pledged to come to the same level of sharing of information as under Jody. I think a lot of work still needs to be done on, on that front, but it, it's, it's a necessary step. Uh, just as we always need to measure, we need to appreciate where the, uh, where the stock is. Now, the second part of uh, Mr. Talley's question, there was only a, 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 a slight hint to my published remarks as to you referring to this, this particular remarks. And it's the issue of uh, a direct link between common resources and, and the banks. And that is clearly with a view to avoiding the transit via the sovereign to try to avoid this vicious circle that we are observing uh, between sovereign banks, banks, sovereign, sovereign banks, and so on and so forth, and where we advocate that uh, the link be direct between those common resources and, and the banks. Maybe you can take this first part of the yeah. question. So your other question, I mean, I think uh, what the managing director was referring to the example in the U.S. of a price around twenty-five dollars per ton. Uh, the price that's mentioned in the ebook uh, is $20 per ton. 
it doesn't reflect, it does, it's related in that book to some sort of goals about parts per million, 350, 450, 550, and it's certainly not put down as a recommendation for every country at every moment or as a position of the IMF. It's much more framed in the context in which the managing director has been talking today of advice, discussion, dialogue, country specific uh, management and ownership of their policies. Uh, and ba based on memory, I think it's a little bit uh, higher than the Australian price setting and a little bit lower than the uh, French price setting. But that's <coughs> Do you have time or, or I don't know if there are other questions or comments? No. I think it's probably better to be disciplined and stop. Let me uh, thank you again, the development community and the environmental community <laughs> want to help you push back on any buzz that the IMF is moving into areas where it doesn't belong. I mean, I think as a global institution, we need the kind of leadership you're bringing. Thank you so much.